it's a new opportunity for social work. I'm Nancy Hoyman, and I'm the co-PI of the CSWE Center for Gerontological Social Work Education, or as most of you know us, as the Gerald Ed Center. As you know, our center emphasizes competency-based professional education, and given that, we recognize the imperative that faculty and students have the knowledge, skills, and the values to be able to work effectively within the rapidly changing environment that's been created by the ACA. You're undoubtedly joining us today because you also recognize that social workers must be at the table and engaged in the new community-based programs and policies that are being rolled out by the ACA. Our impression so far has been that relatively few social work programs are now including content in their required curriculum on the ACA although I think many more programs are identifying the need to do so. And again, I think that's probably why you're here today. We believe that the competencies and content related to the ACA need to be infused in both the master's and the undergraduate curriculum across micro, meso, and macro courses, um, just as you, many of you have already infused aging into your required curriculum. Since we started planning this webinar, the immediacy and visibility of the ACA has certainly become much greater, although not all of the visibility has been positive. The unexpectedly high demand for this webinar confirms for us that we are tapping a need. And so this webinar is a first step toward preparing you and your students for leadership in many of the new initiatives created by the ACA. To help us launch our ACA webinars, we are really fortunate to have today's two presenters, Robin Golden and Sandy Atkins. I want to note that because of a scheduling conflict, June Simmons was unable to participate, but we are most appreciative of Sandy's willingness to step in and um, present on their work um, that she and June are both engaged in. As you know, both Robin and Sandy are highly respected for their leadership and their commitment to improving the health and well-being of older adults and their families. To save time, I'm not going to restate our speaker's numerous accomplishments, but just briefly, Robin Golden is the Director of Health and Aging at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, where she's responsible for developing and overseeing health promotion and disease prevention, mental health, care coordination, and transitional care services for older adults and their families. And she's known nationally for developing innovative initiatives and systems integration. Robin's past chair of the American Society on Aging and currently co-chairs the National Coalition on Care Coordination. Sandy Atkins has over 25 years of experiencing, experience planning and managing services for older adults. She's the vice president of the Institute for Change and Research Center at the Partners in Care Foundation, where she's in charge of the home meds demonstration and dissemination and the development of new initiatives. Prior to joining Partners in Care, Sandy served as Executive Director of Hospice of Pasadena. And at the USC Andrus Gerontology Center, she directed the Center for Long-Term Care Integration a state-funded effort to help counties integrate their Medicare and Medi-Cal systems. Again, more information about both presenters is located on the Gerald Ed Center website. A few logistical items to remind you. Your lines are currently muted to eliminate background noises. But if you have questions for the presenters, type them directly into the question answer box. And then we will try to address those questions at the end of the webinar. Robin is our first presenter, and I'm delighted to welcome her to today's webinar. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Heather and Suzanne. We could not do this without all of us together, and Gero Ed Center, of course, was so thoughtful to predict the importance of this subject at this time, so thank you for inviting me. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the ACA social work and care coordination, because that's what I'm going to hone in on today, because in the last you know, five years when we've been anticipating health care reform, this is what's bubbled up to me as the import, most likely, for our field and the opportunities that we should grab. 
And I think um, the, pro the provisions really do create opportunities for new social work roles and avenues to, sus to sustain some of our roles and hopefully in increase them as well. Um, some of the provisions of ACA include changing incentives, changing payment structures, and moving away from fee-for-service. And I know Sandy will address that as well. Uh, it's a different time. Next, Heather. We are going to be saying next to Heather, so I won't say Heather each time. <laughs> but I just wanted to be polite one time, Heather. Um, there are many social factors that are affecting health outcomes. And I feel like our day has come. For the first time, I feel like at national meetings, in the press, social determinants are being raised much more often. For so long, um, there have, you know, it, it's just been ignored. It's all been about physical health. It's all been about disease. So this is an, an exciting time. The not so exciting this time is I think social factors and people's needs are so increasing in the community because of the devolution of a lot of our social services that it's a, sometimes even a harder time to get needs met, but that's a whole other webinar. Um, so the issues of low education, lack of social support, and social exclusion have all been found to have an impact on poor self-management, which is a real hot button item in the ACA. You'll hear things about self-management, adherence, all those kinds of words, um, patients pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, to, to say it more dis distinctly. And that, um, that's a different world, and it's being expressed in a policy format, and how that will play out for patients and providers is yet to be determined. Um, housing and transportation are huge issues. We know that as social workers, we hear this all the time. And this increases health care costs and utilization. There's, there's a little more evidence related to this, and we need to keep reinforcing that. Um, it was interesting, last week I was at a meeting, and you know, housing and transportation, those were the two key items that came up throughout the meeting. And it was interesting that there were some policymakers in the room. Some heard it for the first time. Some said, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. And some really were riveted and said, we must do something about it. So, that third set we'll try to work on. Um, and then the whole, the whole area of health disparities and psychosocial issues are huge. And the hot button item, too, that I'll talk a little bit more about is preventable hospitalizations and mortality. And that seems to be a big ticket item with the Affordable Care Act and its triple aim of improved health, decreasing costs, and in, improving care. OK, next. In a study that was done in 2011 by RWJ Foundation, it looked at 1,000 primary care physicians. And I thought that was very interesting what they said very clearly, because there, a lot of the ACA is basing the future of care on the notion of primary care and primary care taking a more leadership role. And, and luckily, it doesn't always mean physicians. It means primary care nurses, too. I would like to suggest it should be primary care social workers as well. And I'll get into that a little later. But what they said in that study, that survey, was that 85% of them felt that social needs were directly contributing to poor health. However, only if not all of them felt com confident they could meet those social needs. And that it was actually hurting their ability to provide quality care. And then, it, ironically, if they were able to write a prescription for social needs, that one out of seven of their prescriptions written would be around psychosocial issues. And that it went on to further say the survey that as a result of all this, that very often psychosocial issues are treated, not, are ignored sometimes, but also treated when they are treated as more physical concerns. So social work operates in this blind spot. And if we can just play this out a little more about our import in this area, I think we're going to be in a, a better place and a good place. Next. So this is kind of an interesting a diagram that I've been using. Uh, it's based on an adapted from Ian Morrison, who's a healthcare futurist. But if you look at the orange line, it's coming up orange on mine, you'll see that we are going from this traditional fee-for-service payment system, where we were caring just simply about volume, you know, getting heads and beds in the hospitals, just like hotels. That's what people have said, you know, just get their head in a bed. But the, the day has changed, and we're looking at population health. Look at that blue line on the bottom going up. 
We're looking at pop population health, managing populations, thinking about preventions, looking at readmission penalties, bundled payments, accountable care organizations. These are all the words associated with the Affordable Care Act, all the, the lingo and the methodology contracting with employers and looking at the whole health exchange, looking at more integrated care with Medicare Advantage plans. So it's kind of a different way. We're going toward integration from fee-for-service value, um, more interested in that than volumes. Um, so that I just thought the curve was a good illustration for you to see. Next. So these are some of the reform components, as I mentioned, readmissions. There are going to be financial penalties. And what we'll need to work on in this area is the whole area of quality and patient safety. And that's an important area. What role do we play in that area of improving you know, quality of care? And we do. We're often the gap filler in many ways. We're often the leader in connecting the dots. Value-based purchasing, people are going, providers are going to be paid for value. It's going to be based on performance on core measures. And that's where things like care coordination and evidence-based care maps are going to be relevant. And that's an important area for us to look at. The third area probably isn't as critical, but a big emphasis is the whole notion of infections and hospital-acquired conditions. For us, it means, and it should be a reinforcement for all providers, is how do you keep people out of hospitals? Because sometimes they get sicker there. Next. The other aspect of this is the whole coverage expansion, which is what's going on now and the big to-do and trying to get everybody on, and it seems like things are being fixed some. And, and you know, this will be an amazing aspect of having more coverage for people um, when, it, when it does work. Um, the whole area of bundled payments is a really interesting one because the traditionally it's that acute care, huge hospital system that has been the, the mothership. Um, and times are going to be changing because the payments for, for a person's situation. So if I, someone I know had a stroke, the payment to the hospital is going to be connected to the payment for the rehab facility, the then nursing home if they're there for a little while, and then the home health care. So that's going to be one lump sum. That's putting providers in a sandbox that have never necessarily worked together well. So this will be an interesting time to see how that all happens. And then the whole area of accountable care, um, man, you know, groups are coming together to manage care around shared savings. And then the whole patient-centered medical homes that I've talked about is, is changing stuff uh, dramatically, and I'll get into that a little more. Next. So let's talk about the avoidable readmission penalty. I spend probably half my day on this subject alone at Rush. Um, hospitals who are um, attentive to this, and not all of them are, are really nervous about the fact that their hand is going to be slapped, if you will. They're going to get a penalty. If someone comes back after a hospital admission, if they come back within 30 days, and not just coming back to the institution that they were for their prior hospitalization, but any other hospital, the original hospital is still going to get a penalty. And this is expanding and targeting some conditions, and then it's grown just this past October to cover more. Um, and you can actually decide um, based on, you know, your, you being a consumer, and this is a very different transparent world. You can go on the CMS website and see how various hospitals are doing in this area and maybe make that determination, oh, you know, they have a high readmission rate, they have a low readmission rate, and determine as a result where you might want to go. This is going to indeed expand to nursing homes and home health agencies, too, where they are going to... Um, be penalized if there's higher readmissions in those areas from their um, provider situations back to a hospital as well. So everybody is is talking this. You can't, you know, you see all these conferences and everybody trying to get into this area to see how to improve it. And the trick is some people are getting into it from very much a business perspective and how do we work with the private sector, the business world to to see, you know, how how if we can make a difference together without making this just about profit, which has been an interesting part of what I've been seeing lately because people see this as an expansion area that they can make some money in. 
Okay, next. Then the, so there's a carrot part to this program, which has been very exciting for many of us which has been um, the Community-Based Care Transitions Program, and it's Section 3026 of the Affordable Care Act. And it's funding to hospitals and community-based entities that furnish evidence-based transition services to Medicare beneficiaries at high risk for readmission. So we are literally being paid, many hospitals who are part of this program, many community-based organizations, that's what's exciting about this program, is that in, it in incentivize community-based organizations to approach the hospital to say, let's do this together because this is a time that we can all be involved. We need this village to keep people out of the hospitals, and we can be helping you hospital because we know, we know the community. Hopefully they have social workers. Hopefully there's follow-through then around more care coordination and case management on the community side. So there are 100 of these programs nationally currently being funded. Un unfortunately, with sequestration, there were many more in the pipeline that got stopped. Um, but we're all watching to see what will come of this, because this may create a fee-for-service benefit, which not only nurses could bill for, but social workers could bill for. And it's, this is a very exciting aspect of the law. Next. Then there's the bundle payments I mentioned, where the acute care and the physician services, care coordination, transitional care, and then post-acute are all going to be wrapped into one. And there's some pilots going on, so it's going to be very interesting to watch this as well. Next. The medical homes. So medical homes have become a big term with the Affordable, Affordable Care Act. And what's so exciting is what, what it means, you know, People, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy kind of name for it because we know people live in their home homes or want to live in their homes. It's not a medical home. But most people do want, and it's consumer surveys have said it, they want someone to be their quarterback. They want someone to know what's going on with their health care. But we want to take it up a notch and make sure it includes things like their long-term care as well, their community-based supports. How do you wrap that all in and and have that as an aspect of the medical home, because there's a payment structure for that. But it's not just when the person is related to their hospital visit or their primary care doctor visit, but much beyond them living in the community with services and supports, and how do we connect all that. So there's some additional funding for that care coordination. But it's not clear kind of, again, what role we can play in that as social workers. I do think there's a path to it, but it hasn't been clearly um, legislated as in the ACOs that I'll talk about next, about how, you know, how important it is to get that interdisciplinary team to the table. Next. So there's the ACOs, and this is the Shared Saving Program, 3022 of the Affordable Care Act. And it's very interesting. These may be going up around you, where networks of physicians and other providers are coming together to do this work together in an integrated way, a cooperative way, and to share whatever savings may result from their cooperation gets divvied up among them. So if they're really based on the RWJ report and the social determinants aspect of what I said earlier, if they're really going to do this right, they're going to have social determinants and psychosocial issues at the table. And that hopefully would mean us at the table. So let's let's hope that happens. And some are, and, and Nancy and Suzanne and Heather and I, uh, with uh, uh, some other groups, have been looking at this to see what role social workers are playing in, ACO, in ACOs. What happens very often is some of them do have a social worker here or there, but they're not necessarily saying what how clearly that social work role is or measuring it, which what which we know is so critical in order to keep it part of these programs. So let's go on to the next one. So just in terms of the duals, which is a huge aspect of the Affordable Care Act and CMS and health care reform in general, is we're talking about both people on Medicare and Medicaid. And this is about 12% of our Medicare beneficiaries uh, who are near poor. And they are the sickest and the poorest. And they use most of the health care services something around 36% of Medicare spending, and usually higher with worse health conditions. 
And there's typically, you know, the duals, the best programs for duals we have in this country are PACE programs, programs for all-inclusive care to the elderly, but there aren't enough of them. Most people who are dually eligible are in, you know, systems all over between the silos of care and falling through those silos. So there's also, uh, as a result, because of that lack of coordination, just from the funding sources, Medicare stream versus Medicaid stream, they haven't been as connected. They're falling through the cracks, but even more so because they're seeing people, they're using the emergency room very often, and there's a high rate of inappropriate and potentially avoidable hospitalization. So this is an area that's going to be a hot one to watch, and there's a whole office of dual eligibles now at CMS. Next. So this, of course, is a very much a social justice issue because we're talking about low-income women, typically African-American, people um, of other multicultural backgrounds, multiple chronic illnesses, people with disabilities under age 65. These are the folks that, that are, uh, need our attention more than, more than any, uh, I think, in many ways. They have greater medical needs, functional limitations, cognitive limitations. They are also more likely to live in long-term care facilities and to use emergency rooms. And we hear that all the time from low-income people. We wonder, why did you come to the emergency room rather than your doctor? Well, very often because the emergency room doesn't have a copay, because they got, had transportation to the emergency room because they called 911 and they, didn't have to, they couldn't pay out of pocket to get to their primary care doc. So there are a lot of, again, these psychosocial, financial, environmental reasons that get in the way of people going to the more expensive aspects of the healthcare system unnecessarily. Next. So here's kind of a, a, a visual of what I just said um, in terms of the more emergency room visits. Um, there really is a dramatic dis difference with you look, when you look at duals in terms of the red bars over the blue, the rest of the Medicare only. Next. And again, a hot item for avoidable hospitalization for duals because this is where Medicare, when they think about saving money, you know, the most a high aspect of utilization is hospitalization. So it's all about how do you keep people out? How do you keep people out of the emergency room? How do you keep them in their medical home? And I think this is another visual of how much could be saved, um, over $4 billion potentially avoidable. Um, not to mention, hopefully, let's basically say this, the patient suffering of what happens in the disruption of when they go into the hospital unnecessarily and sometimes even become sicker as a result um, physically and maybe more disoriented. All those sorts of things have been shown. Next. So our emphasis is on integrating these two systems of care, expanding home and community-based services, which is very much a part of the Affordable Care Act, and Sandy will get into that more, to talk more about money follows the person, getting people out of institutions who don't need to be there and into the community. And these are all emphasized throughout in so much of our social work principles. Next. So the Innovation Center was a really exciting aspect um, that all of us were waiting with bated breath for because so often people who had um, Medicare demonstration projects up until now, they would be working in Seattle or Chicago or Washington, D.C. or uh, Salt Lake City on their own programs and not know what the other ones were doing. What the Innovation Center is supposed to do is bring those programs together when there are demonstrations to be able to have more of a rapid learning process. And as a result, evidence-based best practices would be turned around more quickly and scaled more quickly as a result. So there's a fair amount of money going into this. There are about 100 innovation projects um, funded so far. There's another round in for uh, being reviewed, and we've tried to look at some of these to see where social work is showing up. It's tough to sort out again, but we keep trying because we would love, ideally, an overlay evaluation around some of these if we, if we could get the Innovation Center to really hear the importance of, you know, looking at social work differentially within these projects so we could talk about the difference we're making so maybe in the future for all of the demonstration pilots, whatever you want to call them, coming out of CMS, there will be of a, a more of a mandate saying you're not just, you know, you have to have a social worker on your team. So 
it's exciting to watch. We're not, we hope the data will be transparent and will be coming out soon. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking at that. And this is critical you know, to try to integrate into curriculum. Because let me talk now about some significant roles for social work in these areas. Next. So I think there's ways to thrive under reform by engaging patients in so much of what social workers learn and what we need to emphasize in school has to be um, things such as you know motivational interviewing and what we can do it so many times we've been told that rush alone you know oh or we've been said, said people have said to us oh we didn't know social workers could help with patient adherence we thought that was more a role of psychologists or and not that psychologists don't do it well as too, but we we can play uh, an aspect of that, and we can be in that realm around patient adherence, prevention, and wellness. Um, this is a time of not just looking at transactions transactions in history, but a journey and a narrative around that journey, and that's so important for us as social workers. And we're going to focus on not just the illness, but the burden of the treatment. And we're going to be talking about cost and quality in the same breath. And where do we fit into all of this? So next. So I really think social works and interdisciplinary teams in practice is where we need to, to emphasize that we're both valuable contributors to the team and effective leaders. And this is what we have to transmit to our students and, as well. You know, it's a, it's a different world. We used to talk about healthcare social work. We used to talk about mental health social work. We need to bring those together because it's all going to be integrated. So how do we talk about we have a Brighton project, for example, which, which really emphasis, emphasizes social work role uh, in terms of mental health. And um, we also then have a bridge model that we've developed where we look at social work and transitional care, because up until our project, mostly nurses were providing this care. Um, and we said, again, we didn't say nurses can't do it. We said, we think we can do this too. And then how do we look at social work in the patient-centered home and ACOs? And that's something we've been looking at, too, at Rush. Next. So we have this Brighton program where we have been wrapping around primary care settings for a long time. And we are part of the team with all the folks, the patient, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the PT, OT, nutritionist, chaplain. And you know what's interesting is we, it's a virtual team. So it's not an expensive team that has to meet face-to-face -face all the time. And not only is the social worker on the team, but the coordinators of the teams are social workers as well. So it's an exciting piece. We've had a fellowship program, postmasters, and we've shown some great results. So next. So the bridge model is our primary goals have been to making sure that patients receive appropriate services in their home post-discharge. We get involved not as a discharge social worker, but post-discharge. And not because the social workers or the case managers who may be nurses did anything wrong in the discharge process, but we've noticed things fall apart once people leave the hospital. And this is where we get involved to connect patients to their physicians for follow-up appointments, to assess what else is going on, to support the caregivers and reduce their stress and burden to help people self-manage their conditions more, you name it, that's been our role. Next. And um, it's been an exciting role that's been growing and developing, and we work with other team members as well. We bring in, you know, not only their physicians, but sometimes when we talk to the physicians after a hospitalization, it's the first time the physician even knows that they, their patient was in the hospital. So. Let's go on next, I'm conscious of the time. And then we've been trying to roll social work and wrap social work around patient medical homes to show, to address the gaps in care that result from sometimes the physicians not having sufficient time, staff, or resources. We act in this um, complementary and compensatory way. And it's, it's an exciting new role. And we look at the psychosocial considerations, that blind side, and integrate it within the electronic medical record and the physician's plan, try to be a part of the team, not necessarily always in the office, but wrapping around and being viewed as a, um, a significant resource for which to send their patients to. 
and we've been calling that our AIMS model, the Ambulatory Integration of Medical and Social AIMS. So next. So just to show you some outcomes, the Brighton Project, the Mental Health Project, we've lowered depression and anxiety scores. In Bridge, we've increased communication with physicians and keeping medical appointments, decreased mortality. In the patient-centered medical home, we've increased well-being, decreased stress. Uh, we've had more time for medical. The doctors feel that they have more time for medical issues. And however, the social work evidence is not extensive enough. And it's ongoing challenge for us to make sure we're at these tables. But at least doing this work is making a difference, we think. Next. So I think I talked about the importance of teams and how um, you know there's so little incentive for teams. So let me skip to the next one, Heather. So again, they're getting to the table. How do we find that cross-institutional ways to collaborate? They're critical. And how do we you know, frame it from speak the other profession's language while still holding on to ourselves? And that's an important part at what we need to be teaching our students, those terms, um, not in a defensive way or an aggressive way, but in a calm way that will help us get to those tables. Next. So I think there, there is a future here. And in, in order to meet the triple aim, uh, we have to get there by talking about the importance of making our business case clear and the return on investment from a social work involvement. It's those business terms that I think are, have to creep into our literature a little more. And then let me skip to the end, Heather, because of the time. So I think the imperative is clear. Go back one more. Uh, how do we integrate the social determinants? How do we look at prevention, care coordination? Again, it takes all of us, particularly with complex older patients that we're dealing with. But we have to keep trying to innovate and in making our um, case and talking about the import for, on the, from the patient and community perspective, or the client perspective. So I'd like to turn it back to uh, Nancy or pass it on to Sandy. Yes, well, I just want to thank you so much, Robin. That was such a rich and informative presentation. I, we need to move on to Sandy's presentation. And then if there is time at the end, we welcome questions from the participants. So Sandy, we're delighted that you can um, present with us. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope uh, my voice is coming through OK. I had to call back on another phone when my battery died in the middle. Um, I think uh, what I'm talking about is our adventures in changing ourselves and changing the healthcare partners in our local area. So um, stay tuned for <laughs> all of the things that we're doing to to make an impact on healthcare and on therefore on people and patients in in our world. And the reason for doing this is, and I don't think I have a slide on this, so because we can't count on government funding to keep on you know, supporting, for example, the Older Americans Act. These things are subject to legislative allocations, similarly in our states and our counties and our local cities. Everything is becoming politicized and polarized. And we don't want to be caught in the headlights just kind of staring at the truck bearing down on us. We're, we need to be proactive and find new ways to bring the gifts that we have to people and systems in the country. And also, um, I, I would be most relieved not to be spending almost all of my time writing grants, but rather doing innovations and um, looking for ways to, to improve everything. So that's kind of what we're about. Uh, and Robin did a, just a beautiful job of already covering most of this. Um, but in the healthcare system, there is just change everywhere. And um, we talk about having to be nimble because uh, you know we talk, we start talking to a hospital, and then two months later it's acquired, and now we're talking to a health system. So it's just there's so much consolidation going on, and the future is unpredictable. So we need to, in our hearts and souls, know that the way that we're going to make a difference is to be. Um, not only proactive, but also responsive, and to be able to be like those basketball players that are looking for the place to pass the ball next. 
Um, infrastructures and reimbursement are, are transforming. Um, luckily, there's an emphasis on prevention, which means that you know the, the the word suffering you know may be a little extreme, but whenever you prevent something in healthcare, you're preventing suffering as well as enabling people to live a richer, fuller life. Um, the roles of hospitals, physicians, and payers are are blurring um, as the ACOs what the um, what they mean is that um, the, we're trying to build a system where incentives are all aligned. The Kaiser system is sort of a model, but are there ways to create a Kaiser-like system without having everything be under a single organization? And that's what the, all of the experimentation and ACOs and that kind of thing are, are doing, which means that everybody has a role and we're pushing everybody up to the top of their license, which also means bringing in more people all along the continuum of skills so that everybody can do what they do best rather than trying to do everything. And as part of this, the role of the community agency is growing, which brings social work into the forefront. And the next slide will say more about that. And um, this makes us a perfect partner for healthcare, um, especially uh, the dual eligibles that um, Robin um, discussed earlier. That's, that's basically because these, we can't have fragmented care for the, the frailest, the most needy people in our system. And as she said, a lot of their needs don't have to do with their, their bodies so much as their environments and, and their, their lives. Next slide. So uh, what we're finding is that healthcare plus social, co social services means better health and lower costs. And just in case anybody isn't familiar with the triple aim, it's basically better health, better care, or better patient experience of care, and lower cost. And, and if we can accomplish all three of those, that's a big wow for our country um, and, and its future. So social services are addressing the social determinants of health. And as Robin mentioned in that Robert Wood Johnson survey, doctors know this. They just don't know what to do about it. So, but people are making their personal choices in their everyday lives. Social work can help them make better choices. Isolation, family structure issues, caregiver needs, again, social work fills in that gap. The environment, we can find home safety issues, we know the neighborhoods, we know how to deploy resources, and then the economics of um, con connecting people with what they need to, to meet their own needs. Um, social service agencies per se have advantages over a lot of the healthcare organizations because um, we tend to have a lower cost structure. I, I know for example, um, hospitals, and they, they just, you know, they're unaffordable. They, <laughs> it, it, it may seem cruel to say we should keep our costs low, but um, that means that we will get more business, and it's sort of the volume versus um, the individual cost issue. We have, we go into the home, we spend time with people, we probe, we ask the right questions, we have trust, we have a different authority um, structure. We have the cultural and linguistic competence, and we have high impact evidence-based programs that we can deploy. So all of this makes us um, attractive, especially to, I would say, health plans and the payers rather than necessarily um, the other providers out there in the world. Next slide. And this is a picture. Partners in Care Foundation is rather a unique organization because our, our purpose is actually to affect change in, in healthcare and community services. And so we do a lot of consulting and partnering. Um, we do research and evaluation, but we're also really a fairly small independent nonprofit organization. So we, we became part of the UCLA Health Systems team looking at their strategic plan, and they actually engaged us to um, facilitate some work that they were doing to create a vision of how they could um, improve the health of their patients by engaging community services. So I love this picture because it, it, it shows three sectors, which was palliative and end-of-life care, um, where social work has a big 
role in helping people with their advanced care planning, supporting people when they get the bad news that things are, aren't going so well. Then in the prevention and self-management, which is almost the opposite end of things, we have great um, roles in medical management and medication management, behavioral health, fall prevention. Hopefully all of these will sound um, very familiar as things that you do. Uh, and then, of course, in the long-term services and support, sort of in the middle between the prevention and the end of life, we've got caregiver support, the, the services that help people as they lose functional or cognitive capacity, and um, long-term care. Next slide. So one of this is basically the way that healthcare looks at populations, and uh, you, I'm, I presume you've all heard of the term population health management, which is what uh, health plans have to do, big, big picture, and then they, they determine what they're going to do for individuals by looking at populations. So, and they always talk about patient population stratification. So looking at it as a pyramid with little lines is sort of how they stratify things. So you've got people who really don't need much intervention. They just need continued prevention. And then as you get into a diagnosis of a chronic condition, um, possibly with some impairment, then those folks need to learn how to manage themselves. They need self-care. They need to know pre how to prevent uh, their symptoms from getting worse. And so there's a lot that social work can do in those areas. And then, you know, as, as people move uh, toward the end, then there's a lot more to be done in advanced care planning, in long-term care, and in home palliative care, which, by the way, um, we did a study with Kaiser and found that providing in-home palliative care for the last six months to a year of life saved the health system 35% of their costs. Next slide while also improving their quality of life. So um, the, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation have been kind of trying to reconcept what's going on in healthcare. And what they said was there have been three stages so far. There's the 1.0, which was acute care focused. And then the 2.0 healthcare system was starting to try to coordinate seamless healthcare across primary care and um, and acute care. And then now we're coming into a community integrated healthcare system. Um, I think the dual eligible focused is, us on that, but it's true for everybody. And that's where social work really comes in because we're looking at population based health outcomes and integrating the healthcare system with community resources. Next slide. So this is how we've been looking at what are the opportunities for us as a nonprofit uh, social service agency and for all of the other folks like us out there in the world. And so um, all of these areas will be under the purview of, of a healthcare system. So at the bottom where we've got our senior centers and, and home delivered meals or congregate meals, classes, um, exercise and socialization. The Medicare Advantage Plan should be interested in that to keep people well. Uh, capitated or at-risk medical groups, likewise. Anybody who's taking um, a, a bundled payment, shall we say, for um, all of the care of, a, of a, an individual should be interested in keeping people at that, that most functional and least needy level of care. Of course, people do, as, as they age, uh, acquire chronic illnesses, and that's where um, those same groups, but also the dual eligible plans that are developing around the country, Medicare Advantage, that's the MA, and uh, Special Needs Plans, SNP, SNP as they call it, um, come into chronic disease management. And there are legislated um, requirements to do disease management, and that's where we can step in and offer ourselves to help with that. So we have a whole um, arsenal of evidence-based self-management programs. The Administration on Community Living has 
um, authorized uh, using Older Americans Act fund cities, but there are also things that we want to interest the healthcare system in paying for because we can't count on the Older Americans Act to even maintain with sequester all of the agencies around the country are losing funding. So how do we make it up? We bring the value we've been bringing of basically under government funding and we say we'll save you money, we'll make your patients happier and more satisfied, you pay us. And, and I'm, I'm not saying this just hypothetically, people are paying us for these things. Um, as, we, as we advance, we've got the care transitions. Um, these are short-term interventions that try to keep people from um, marching up to the next step, which was, is when they need hands-on long-term services and supports. So in this uh, care transitions, home meds, home safety assessment, we are, we are as an agency collecting money from health care systems under contract as well as the CMS funding that uh, Robin talked about. And the reason that folks are willing to pay for this is that these interventions have been shown to reduce the use of emergency departments and hospitalizations. And um, for, ho for motivating hospitals, we're looking to re uh, reduce readmission um, and the pay for performance types of penalties that they're getting. We're, we're actually um, finally getting paid to go into the home, do it a, a home visit just to do our home meds, home, safe, home um, intervention that uses social workers to locate problems. Uh, and then uses pharmacists to solve the problems with medications. And then while we're in the home, of course, we do a complete assessment. And um, yesterday I was giving testimony to the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, and we showed so many problems that were uncovered by social workers using the home med software that had already been missed by the hospitals doing a so-called medication reconciliation. It's a new role for social workers. It's, it's like get out of your comfort zone, but it is an, an amazing impact that they can have in, in a, a group of people being discharged from the hospital. In a capitated medical group, we're finding 66% of them have problems that the pharmacist feels that the, the physician prescribers need to address. That's an amazing contribution by um, you know a half hour of extra effort from a social worker to prevent falls, to prevent confusion, and improve the quality of life of people. Um, once you get up the pyramid into the long-term services and supports and caregiver support, this is where the dual eligible plans really um, pop in because most of the other health care plans are not at risk for uh, long-term care. And, but it, when you have a dual eligible health plan, they are going to be at risk for a nursing home forever till death do us part. And so keeping people out of the nursing home, which we call nursing home diversion, is going to be a big motivator for them. And that's where we bring high value, lots of experience through the years and uh, known relationships with people in the community. And of course, end of life is, is sort of an issue that, that you know, it's over-medicalized in our society. It's 25% of all Medicare expenditures. In the Los Angeles area, this, the last six, six months of life cost an average of $60,000. It's just a, a, an astonishing, uh, pardon me, but probably a waste of most of those dollars. And so everybody's interested in reducing those costs uh, dual eligible plans, Medicare Advantage, ACOs, um, and the Medicare Shared Savings Plans. But the purpose is not to save money per se, but the purpose is to improve quality of life because satisfaction, family relationships, all of these things go better when, when we do our, the advanced care planning and provide palliative care rather than um, keep on treating illnesses with, with uh, assault and battery care at the last few months. Next slide. And th this is just the way we're looking at our new business models. So we have kind of three ways that we're spending our time improving self-management for those more well early 
diagnosis and chronic care assessments, care coordination and coaching. So we have our care transitions, home meds, home safety, short and long-term service coordination, a short especially for people right out of the hospital when um, we're actually doing Robin's Bridge program. Um, and so we also have um, Adult Day. CBAS is, was an attempt, that's Adult Day Health in California. They renamed it, trying to get rid of it, actually. Um, and then we're also trying to build provider networks for efficient delivery system because, frankly, nobody's going to co be contracting with you know, 52 little organizations. We have to gather everybody together into a single network. Next slide. So just very, very quickly, um, the Stanford Chronic Disease Self-Management is one of those interventions that we can bring to the world, and we find that it increases people's um, exercise, energy, psychological well-being, uh, decreases pain, depression, shortness of breath, limitations on their roles, um, and all of those wonderful things. Next slide. But also, it going to save money. So it's hitting everything on that triple aim that the Institute for Healthcare Improvement has promulgated over the years, outpatient visits, emergency room, hospitalizations, days in the hospital. So it's good, you know, it's one of those win-win for everybody kinds of things. Next slide. And then assessments and care coordination. This is where you know, we're building business on all of these things. Readmission penalties are um, making people suddenly aware of, of what their lacks are and looking for new partners. And we're stepping in and taking care of things for people and saving money and making uh, people get better and stay better. Um, the, what we've been doing with just a few diagnoses is moving, and Medicare fee-for-service patients is now moving to all patients, all payers, and so um, it's creating a market, and people are, are showing themselves willing to pay for it. Um, and therefore, we're, we're evolving an integrated regional delivery system for all of the services that support people to get and stay well in the community. Next slide. Uh, just a little um, information, 72% of post-discharge adverse events are related to medications, and close to 20% of discharge patients suffer an adverse event. 35% of Medicare patients taking five or more medications, and our home meds program is a social work solution that steps in and takes care of as many as possible of these preventable programs in a safe um, intervention that was designed not to offend uh, physicians and only um, find problems that, that they are really open to and take care of. Next slide. Uh, this is just a, a picture of how we're turning our uh, Medicaid waiver program into a program that's uh, essentially uh, renaming and reconcepting pretty much the same services and turning them into a, a program to serve dual eligibles. And I don't think any of these are, are, are unknown to any of you. But it puts um, the, the nurse in a, in a small role, but you need a nurse on the team to appeal to um, health care a lot of times. The client and family are central and the social worker has a bigger and bigger role. Next slide. No, there we go. So um, what we're talking about is creating regional systems to, to uh, address the regional systems in the healthcare system. So it's, uh, they have um, big networks. We have to be a big network to, to work with them. This is a national movement. The Administration on Community Living has picked nine pilot communities to work on changing the model for the Aging and Disability Services Network. Um, we're adding our value to save costs to the healthcare system downstream. We provide a unique local knowledge, trust, and experience. And the reason that we keep harping on this is there are national for-profit companies trying to swoop in and basically steal what we've been doing um, because they know the jargon and they know how to relate on a business level. So uh, what do we do? We change ourselves, not, not our hearts and not what we do, but we change how we talk to people. 
and we change how we structure ourselves because we can't have dozens of little little bitty agencies and you know 50 different contracts for healthcare system. They won't do it. Next slide. Uh, so we have a grant from the John A. Hartford Foundation. We're working with ACL on, on this to create networks of community-based organizations, contracting with healthcare. So our success is to have a contract um, and then focusing especially on metrics, on measurement, documentation. So no more of this, you know, we're, we're, we're obviously doing good because people are happy. Now we've got to show that, that we're making a difference in the healthcare system. And our ultimate goal is to create tools and, and disseminate them nationally and provide technical assistance to others. Next slide. Um, again, this is, this is what we've done to, um, the foot in the door is how we created relationships with these health plans and what we're offering them. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but, but um, we're offering cons consultation, we become board members, we get on committees, we work on grants together, we say we'll write a grant if you can uh, take care of things. Um, so we've got all of these motivations and then all of the programs on the right hand side is what we bring to them and are being paid for. So sometimes we get paid to be a consultant and then come in and sell home visits, which is a longer term. So we do a short term intervention to, to get a longer term contract. Sometimes we give things away as a pilot and then we, de then we develop a, a business model. Next. And recruiting board members from healthcare is really big. Next slide. So this is kind of a, a, a picture of it. We want the healthcare system to say, one call does it all. You call a network office and you can get all of these different services and the organizations that they represent. So each one of these is also a, representing a different organization in our network. Next slide. So implications, we have to expand our comfort zone. Um, we may be documenting medications, vital signs, things that are, are medical, but, but we don't own the results. Just like with all social work, we're, we're documenting and communicating and connecting. We're not doing. Um, we have to use a lot of technology to support efficiency. And these business opportunities require business practices. We've got to focus on metrics, continuous quality and um, improvement, and rapid response. One little story, uh, a week ago on Friday, a health plan said, we're having a meeting on Monday. We need you to give us a, a, a list of services and pricing by Monday. So we just did it. We, we put it together. You have to be that agile to make it in this world. I think that's my last slide. Next slide. Is there one? Thank you there so much, go. Sandy. Um, I think both Robin and Sandy have clearly conveyed the importance of being flexible, or as Sandy said, nimble, as we try to move in new to new roles and we try to show the importance of what social work is doing and particularly working with other disciplines. Another theme that certainly came through was making sure our students have the competencies to work effectively in interdisciplinary teams. So we unfortunately uh, do not have time for questions. Um, people in advance had submitted a question about how can social work be at a more prominent place at the healthcare policy table. I think that both Sandy and Robin throughout their presentations gave us some ideas of how that can happen. It requires a lot of work and it does require um, being willing sometimes to go outside our comfort zone, but they gave us great tips for how we can be sure that we are at the table. So just in closing, we want to remind you that the recording of this webinar will be available on the Gerald Ed Center website so you can share it with your students or other faculty colleagues. There is a bibliography on social work and the ACA on our website, but it's also available for downloading from this site. It's there in the box on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are planning to offer a series of webinars on the ACA beginning in the spring. 
and we would greatly appreciate your completing the short evaluation um, after the webinar. The link will pop up on your screen after the meeting ends, but your feedback will be really useful to us as we move forward with planning future webinars. So I want to thank everyone for your participation. I thank our presenters for providing such a wealth of information with implications for how we prepare our graduates to work in this changing environment, and wish everyone um, happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.